that since inception, NESFAS has disbursed incorrect amounts as reported. NESFAS beneficiaries have been receiving correct allowances amounts based on the registration data and claims submitted by institutions. Here you must realize the importance of institutions submitting correct data to us, data on time as well. Now, you will have noticed um, in the past few weeks um, what has been going around on social media about huge chunks of money um, deposited into student accounts. I saw a figure of two million rands uh, and above uh, that was uh, cited as one of uh, the main evidences of uh, the inefficiency of the system. Uh, we want you to know today that we investigated that quite promptly and found that that was fake. The fact that you have got such uh, amounts uh, uh, spread around in the social media uh, and you've got the system discredited to that, uh, to that um, extent is very instructive. Uh, and I think it's something that we should, uh, we should all take, uh, we should take uh, seriously. The, the system uh, has got its own advantage, are the advantages among which are the following. The system is secured by banking, a banking environment, security, uh, laws and regulations. So on the legal side, the system is covered. The system offers student banking freedom through a physical card and a virtual card that enables students to perform, amongst others, the following functions. Withdraw cash at any ATM and point of sale. Transact without limitations to certain retailers. Perform EFT and online Apologies. NASFAS will directly be responsible for an on-time on payment of allowances. The system will provide students uh, centric value added services. The system will provide various financial literacy programs to empower students on managing their finances. The system is so cool and provides students with peace of mind in knowing that they can hold NASFAS uh, uh, to account and NASFAS only for their non-payment or late payment of allowances. It works like a normal bank account and has all the security features of a bank card offered by the big banks and students need not transfer to um, a different account. It gives students financial freedom to accurately plan and budget for their allowances. Students need to have uh, the physical card to transact and they can utilize a virtual, a virtual card and there's a mul multiple ways to transact with uh, the account. NASFAS is in the final stages of uh, negotiating value added services that will see NASFAS beneficiaries enjoy special benefits from specific stores such as discounts and purchases. Just to, to share with you how it works. Once a student has been approved for NASFAS funding, a bank account is created with the details of the student which they will need to authenticate before they can access their, their funds. Just like any other banking solution, no one can access funds without properly verifying their identity in line with, the, with, uh, with FICA. Where we have paid, students will be able to see the bank balance. However, they cannot access their money if they, they did not register and authenticate themselves. Talking about authentication, you, you will all remember cases in the past um, where allowances went to um, targets other than students, 
you remember the many fraudulent cases that we have had. And this system ensures that there is authentication. The authentication process requires that the student produces a proof of their identity. After confirming their identity, students can then create a PIN for their account and access their account and funds as with normal bank accounts. NESFAS will only pay allowance to students whose registration information has been received from institutions. So if no registration information is at our disposal, um, we, we, cannot, we cannot pay students. At this point, um, I want to take you back to some observations by uh, members of the public, by parliament, by the press, just two months ago, that about 5.2 billion rands was erroneously paid to students who were not deserving Against that background, it's only fair for NASFAS to ensure that our authentication process is firm, is effective, and we do not find ourselves funding ghost students. Those that have followed uh, developments in NASFAS will know that some of the investigations uh, happening towards uh, uh, institutions uh, by various law enforcement agencies will point to the possibility of ghost recipients of, um, of our funding. Now, I have indicated earlier on um, that it can never be true that in the past the allowance system never had problems, there were various problems, uh, some of which I've indicated. Um, one of the most uh, pressing problems that we used to have in the past will be that students will be paid late, uh, even though funds were deposited into the account of the responsible um, institutions. All that notwithstanding, we have, we have never seen the kind of reaction, uh, the level of protest that we were receiving um, at this point in time. And I guess that too is, is instructive. Even more disturbing is uh, the level which uh, some go to discredit the system which level includes cyber attacks. Now, party to the ongoing actions to discredit the system has been confirmed, uh, confirmed cases of targeted cyber attacks on the websites of the FinTech companies where our beneficiaries' accounts are hosted. There's no doubt that this is with the intention to steal student data and intercept allowances and render the new system unsafe. NESFAS is investigating such cases and um, the law enforcement agencies. As a matter of fact, we have alerted the law enforcement agencies uh, of such um, activities. Now, coming to a status update, a total of 355,270 paid students, which constitute 86% of the paid students have been able to successfully authenticate themselves and receive their allowance. Call upon the remaining percentage of 14% to please authenticate themselves so that their allowances can be released. If we're not firm on authenticating these students, 
we run a risk of paying ghost students. The systems we have put in place, providing your ID, your face, will ensure that students are properly authenticated. And please let them proceed and do so and save us the trouble of funding ghost students. NESFAS is reviewing and assessing the remaining students that were paid but unable to access their funds because they had not fully authenticated themselves. We do note that some students have been unable to authenticate themselves due to connectivity issues, and NASFAS has sent teams to campuses to assist students with the authentication and verification process. We have also noted that closer to the payment dates, the system experienced technical glitches caused by high internal traffic due to students registering at the same time. Onboarding for TVET College students continue on, on an ongoing basis as new students enroll. A total of 608, um, 608, 601 was paid to NESFAS beneficiaries at public universities, whilst a total of 383,671,000 uh, was, was paid to technical and vocational and training colleges for the month of August alone. As with any introduction of a new system, there's now been some teething issues and genuine cases of students who have not been able to access their allowance with the new solution. Now, in such cases, uh, which case will affect the 14% of the students who are not onboarded, we stand committed uh, to assist in various ways, um, including going to the institutions uh, uh, themselves and physically assist the students on how best to, to onboard. Some of these problems uh, can mainly be attributed to issues of data integration with institutions and system glitches caused by too many students seeking to register onto the system at the same time. We have also had reports of students struggling with the authentication process and require assistance. And once again, uh, in these cases, we deploy officials across various campuses. One of the biggest contributors which is not only specific to the direct payment, has been institutions' non-compliance in submitting registration data. Registration data is either submitted late or incorrectly, and this disarms the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, as we can't pay students which re whose registration has not uh, been confirmed. NESFA's policy requires institutions to send updated registration monthly. Therefore, any wrong payment, such as those paid to students who have dropped out or not attending classes, will, as a result, will be as a result of us not having the information that we need uh, from um, our respective institutions. Now, coming to funding process, relationship with third parties, and the defunding of students, to ensure the correct uh, processing of these applications. NESFAS has partnered with other entities that help us further authenticate the data that we receive from applicants. Now, these institutions will be the state uh, security agency. It will be the South African Revenue Services and the department of home affairs. This is as a, re a response to fraudulent applications um, that uh, NASFAS received um, for a long time during its existence. These partnerships have proven to be fruitful in helping NASFAS make informed decisions. We have had instances where information received through third parties 
is either outdated or inaccurate. And we have been in constant engagement with the third parties in a bid to uh, have real-time data. Now, the contentious issue of the defunding of students. After thorough investigation, improved relationships with third-party data sources such as SARS and engagements with the Auditor General South Africa, NESFA sought to re-evaluate some applications whose funding have been approved. After this exercise, investigations results indicated that some applica as applicants were not deserving of the funding they, and had submitted falsified or fraudulent documents and these had to be instantly defunded as continuation of knowingly funding individuals who do not meet funding requirements will be going against the provisions of the funding policy whilst depriving deserving students. I must pause at this point and just take us back uh, to, to that finding by ourselves, subsequently by the SIU, uh, which was supported, of the 5.2 billion rents that was uh, uh, incorrectly uh, dispensed to undeserving students. Now, this has got huge implications, and I've got no doubt that the Auditor General will be cut to an institution that perennially uh, fund undeserving students. Now, we have received criticisms and criticisms about how insensitive we have been on dealing with um, the funding of um, students who are not, um, who are not deserving. Now, our posture is that as soon as we have got information that provides evidence that applicants have falsified their information, that all that we're paying to them is fraudulent, we must take swift and firm action immediately. If we don't do that, we've got a governance problem. The blame will be on the board, the blame will be on management, and I think it's very important for all of us to understand that we have got to approach this issue with the firmness that it deserves. Now, the question is, will there be faults? Are there instances where in the defining of students uh, there will have been uh, faults on the side of um, the institution. We have accommodated that possibility, um, and management has deliberated upon this extensively, uh, had engagements with student leaders on how best to deal with this, and the route that is being followed by the institution is that those students funded will be communicated to. And if there's any discrepancy uh, to the students on the information that we have, the owners rest on the student to do that, and that shall be, that shall be duly uh, attended to with uh, the care that it, uh, it deserves. Now, a total of uh, 45,927 were affected uh, by this um, action. For example, students will provide correct parental relationships in their first application attempt. And when they get rejected due to the financial status of those parents and they reapply, they submit different parental relationships. When we did re-evaluation, our system picks up the original information previously submitted. And after re-evaluation funding was reinstated, for more than 14,000 students, 31,000 uh, and above remained unsuccessful, with most first-time entering students having a household income of more than 350,000 uh, rands, and retaining students either not meeting their required academic progressions, 
which is 50% of all registered models uh, and not exceeding the well-known N plus rule. Do those who were unsuccessful were given a chance to appeal and submit supporting documents. I must mention at this point that there was no time in the history of the institution that appeals were given as much prominence as they are given now. We have got an independent uh, appeal tribunal headed by an advocate, constituted representative of uh, members of our various sectors, the universities, uh, the Tibet institutions, um, and, 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 and student leaders. We giving so much attention and prominence to appeals to ensure that no student get left out of um, our funding uh, products and processes and failure. Now, on appeals, the NASFAS appeals option allows individuals whose financial standing could have uh, changed between the time of processing of the application and finalization of the funding decision. It could be that a key contributor to their household income may become in incapacitated or a deceased or deceased since the submission of the application or the parents of a student applica uh, applicant are divorced. And in terms of the divorce decree, a court has determined that the, respons the responsibility for child maintenance, including the responsibility of the cost of education, is restricted, restricted to one parent. In February 2023, NESFAS also established an independent appeals tribunal consisting of individuals in the higher education and training sector officials from universities, colleges, um, and student leaders, as I indicated um, earlier on. To date, more than 53,000 appeals have been approved for the 2023 academic year. A good job for the appeals committee. A total of uh, 6,000 appeals have been rejected for either financial ineligibility or academic ineligibility, and such students cannot submit any further appeal in this regard. About 27,000 are waiting supporting documents and messages requesting uh, this has been sent, and this has been sent to applicants and institutions. Other appeals are still in progress. All appeals decisions are subject to budget availability. Student accommodation. The NASFAS board and management conducted site visit to universities. Tibet colleges across the country as well were visited to assess the state of student accommodation for NASFAS funded students. The following key challenges were identified. Insufficient beds to accommodate students. The state of this accommodation not being conducive for student accommodation and learning, such as what we witnessed um, in, uh, in the Free State, at the University of the Free State, uh, a branch, where students were staying next to a literal, not a metaphorical, a literal cattle crawl uh, as, um, as their form of accommodation. And those students were not studying agriculture or animal husbandry. It was then necessary for NESFAS to streamline student accommodation and optimize the process of providing housing for students in a manner that is efficient, cost effective, and, and, and conducive to a good learning um, environment, also a living environment. NESFAS then built an online student accommodation portal wherein all accommodation providers who wish to provide accommodation to NASFAS beneficiaries will register their properties, and this includes institutions. NASFAS also then appointed uh, accreditors to accredit and grade the loaded uh, properties. Once properties have been cleared and deemed fit for student living, the portal will be 
opened for students to apply for accommodation near them. A total of um, 41,245 beds have been registered, and 24,784 across the country have already been accredited. And NASFAS has commenced the process of piloting the new system with selected 18 TVET colleges. It is envisaged that after evaluating the pilot project and mitigating challenges in coward, encountered, the portal will be opened fully for both providers and students in all institutions. NESFAS requested institutions negatively affected by the newly introduced um, 45,000 um, a year accommodation to make their submissions and negotiation with private accommodation providers to adjust, to adjust their rent to there's a task team led by the department that is reviewing the, the CAP. In addition, NESFAS has embarked on a new study uh, with a um, financial institution that seeks to review the approach for next year's CAP for accommodation. The findings on this study will be incorporated in the proposal uh, if uh, finding conditions and criteria that will be used to administer the scheme for the next academic year. NASFAS is constantly looking at ways to amend its funding policies to accommodate the dynamic conditions of the students' life cycle and banks the success of this policy implementation on collaborative efforts with sector stakeholders. We are always open to healthy engagements with other colleague, uh, colleagues in the higher education sector as well as student leadership in ensuring that the journey of uh, our beneficiaries in learning is comfortable and as, as livable as possible. We remain committed to enabling success and access in our education in a responsible and sustainable way. Now, so many things. Um, have been happening in the past um, uh, few days, uh, as I indicated earlier on. Uh, we have seen statements um, coming from various stakeholders. Um, I just uh, caught sight of a statement from Yusuf, uh, putting the blame on the crisis, um, on the protests right at the doorsteps of um, NASFAS. Now, we have greatest of credits to our leaders of higher institutions in the country, uh, in particular the, the vice chancellors and their councils. I call the same respect uh, to to student leaders who mean well for, 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 for their constituencies. We remain committed uh, to work with all the stakeholders. We remain committed uh, to have a collaborative relationship with the leaders of our universities and Tibet colleges. We do not believe a resolution of the current challenges that we're facing lies in the blame game and pointing, and pointing fingers. We all have a responsibility uh, to be objective, uh, to contribute in a manner uh, that seeks to resolve the problems and in a manner that is uh, constructive. It will be incorrect uh, to, to make assumptions that universities are not uh, part of the problem. Again and again I indicated the need for universities to submit registration data for us in time. If we don't do that, uh, the implications are very dire uh, for, for, for nurses. We also take a very dim view uh, 
of an impression given that universities are academic utopias. That's not the case. Universities are also not a one-size-fit-all. They face their challenges. There are universities that were doing very well uh, with, uh, with direct payments. There are others that were not. The Sifako uh, Mahato University, for instance, was doing very well with direct payments. Uh, they will even go to an extent of um, taking the risk of funding students in cases where we were late with our payments. Uh, the same can be said about all institutions. Universities are not a one size fit all. Uh, they've got various challenges as well, some of which are in the public domain. Some universities have, became very, have become very unsafe owing to, amongst others, suspected business interests. We all know about that. We also know that some universities are being investigated for the abuse of NASFAS funds. We also know uh, that there were cases that universities paid students. If, if, if anything, one of the reasons why direct payments are now an issue is because we're dealing with challenges that were faced at an institution level. Now, very instructive that all those challenges uh, being there notwithstanding, we never saw protests to, uh, to, to this extent. I want to emphasize that we would like to work very closely um, with Yusuf. Uh, they enjoy our best respect. And as a matter of fact, the CEO um, has met Yusuf um, several times. I think last year there are certain dates that he has given to us. I had the pleasure uh, to meet the president and the deputy president of USAF uh, less than 10 days ago where we discussed some of the challenges, where we spoke about uh, the need to engage better and how best we, we, we can do that. We are ready to meet Yusuf anytime. Nesvas can meet Yusuf tomorrow. There is no need for university leaders to communicate to us through statements. As a matter of fact, there is no need for university leaders to meet us anywhere else other than in the situation where it's us with them, eyeball to eyeball, discussing discussing issues. We, we expect earnest inputs uh, from university leaders uh, and other academics on the challenges facing the black child in this country. If I were to raise just one um, issue that was raised again and again, the issue of the, accommod uh, the, the accommodation cap, which is kept at 4,500. We must not look at it marginally. It's bigger than that. The accommodation cap talks to a bigger problem. And one of those problems is the land question in South Africa. Why is it that poor people should pay 9,000 rands in Rondebosch? in Bramfontein, in Hatfield, in Stellenbosch. Where do you expect the son or daughter of a teacher to pay 9,000 rands a month for accommodation? And I'm referring to these categories because some of them don't qualify within the 350,000 uh, 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 bracket that constitute uh, the criteria of allocating our, our funds to students. This is where we expect our academics, our leaders of universities, to come in and make constructive inputs on how to deal with this. We, 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 we frown upon student leaders who have got no shame carrying placards and shouting they want the accommodation cap to go on. How do we explain 
carrying a placard and say you want to pay more. Who has ever seen that? How do you, how do you explain that? And what this stimulates in our thinking is, who is actually matching? Is it the property owner or is it the person carrying the broker? I want to appeal to all uh, stakeholders in higher education to be constructive in the manner in which we do things, to engage. Um, and when there are problems like this, let's sit down together and, um, and, and, be pro uh, and, and, and all be, be constructive and engage in a manner uh, that is going to make it possible for the child from the disadvantaged community to have access. Protests, yes, uh, we, we all support that. Uh, if there are any issues that students would like to raise, uh, they can raise them in any form necessary, as long as it's, uh, it's constructive. And in all this, we hope to be working with all uh, stakeholders who care about the future. Ladies and gentlemen, um, <coughs> thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, thank you uh, heartily and Dr. Kotha for the presentation that uh, you have made, and I think uh, it should be clear uh, to all and sundry that a student has a very special place in the heart of NSFAS, and I think it should also be clear that uh, NSFAS is an organization at work, and NSFAS is in good hands. In our midst, we've got our CEO, Mr. Andy Ledongogo, a chartered accountant by profession. Nothing escapes his eye, and he spends sleepless nights if the well-being of a beneficiary at any institution is threatened by delayed payments whatever the reason may be. So you may have heard from the chairperson that the commitment of NSFAS to making sure that access and success of a student in the academic environment is sustained and maintained, that that commitment is unwavering. Without any waste of time, I would like to um, invite members of the media uh, to put uh, questions forward. And uh, the way I propose to do it is that I'm going to go clockwise, taking four questions. And I would like to ask my colleague, uh, the CIO there, to just keep track of the questions. Because I know from experience that some can uh, fall through the cracks. And then once four questions have been dealt with from an answering point of view, we will move on to the next. And I hope we'll be as efficient as possible in terms of the shortness of the questions so that we can uh, cover the broad issues that the, uh, the chairperson of the board has um, dealt with. Can I proceed with opening um, the floor for questions? All right, I'm taking four. I'll note the lady in red. Next, next, right. Can we have the first question, please? Thank you very much. Can we take the next question, the second one?
Thank you very much, a colleague from uh, Sowetan. Um, the third question. Thank you very much, colleague from uh, ENCA. The next uh, question. Thank you very much um, for the questions that we have uh, taken. Uh, I said I'll take four questions um, clockwise, and then I'll just come back anti-clockwise with the next set of questions. All right, I think let me uh, then proceed to, ne to take the next batch. I note only one hand. Uh, please proceed, my sister. Thank you very much. I think uh, in the absence of um, any further questions, I'd like uh, my panel to, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, the panel to respond. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Koso. <coughs> Thank you so much. I will uh, address two questions. Uh, the first is on the allegations against the CEO, um, and the second is uh, how do we avoid the 5.2 billion? I'll talk high level to that, and I will ask the CEO to. I'll also talk to the question on the cost of the state. First, the allegations against, against the city. If I were to preamble this as follows, the, the board stands for good governance. Uh, the board is very conscious of its responsibility to our compliance to and to direct the organization in full observance of the law. Now the board doesn't act on ESA uh, and cannot act on things uh, that it receives uh, winning. Now, I want to put this across very clearly that the board doesn't officially have any complaint uh, against uh, Mr. Mongogo related to uh, his work at the NSS. Now, maybe another way of responding to, to the 
equation of uh, all these things that we all read about uh, in the past is to chronologize the advent of the direct payment system. So step one, when we left there, some decision is taken there. Uh, because of the problems that are there in universities and technical uh, institutions, a direct payment system is the way to go. And we're not, we're not there. We learn there is an item on the agenda. We learn there that Parliament raises this. I don't think it was raised once. It was actually more than once that it was raised. Um, students raise this matter on their own, the need for direct payments, uh, because third party payments um, give them problems. Now fast forward, uh, a bid is advertised in the media, uh, and anyone who is capable of uh, rendering this service is asked to, uh, to present a bid and, uh, and compete with all other bidders. Now at this point, at this point, there's peace, perfect peace in the organization. At this point, Andilo Nongoga is an angel. <coughs> now the adjudication happens. Some win, some lose. All hell breaks loose. It's new. Is all sorts of things that are said about uh, uh, the institution. Is protests, well coordinated protests over the same problems that we had before the direct payments. Well coordinated protests. Those of us who watch the students who are watching, we will, we will have seen that lunchtime there were trucks full of. Uh, KFC and take away uh, related food to give to, to this well, well coordinated. Now I leave that to you to judge. What is it that we are dealing with? Is it the substance of the problems or are we dealing with things other than what, what we can see? Who will prepare to deal with the substance of the issues and nothing in the background? I want to put that there. there. Now, let me come to uh, the 5.2 uh, billion rands. <coughs> now, I must, I must emphasize this. The, the discovery that there were students who were wrongfully funded was made by our own staff. We took this information, we shared that with the SIU, they did some more work on it, really quick. Uh, they found some more. Uh, people who did not benefit, we were very grateful. We were very grateful for that. But this goes back to 2016. Some will say it goes back to about, about 2015. Now, the measures that we spoke about, security agencies are some of the key measures that are meant to deal with this problem. In fact, the reason why we sit here today to be about the funded students, the other side of this problem, the positive side of this problem, is that NESFAS is at work. You lie, you pay. So we deserve a, a pet on the back. On the Cosato statement, any statement um, coming from um, a labor union as prominent as uh, Cosato is not something that should be taken lightly. Uh, they represent workers who are parents, who are at the cold face of um, some of the successes of the NESPAS and some of the problems that may uh, come out of the inefficiencies of our system. 
I would like to, to look at that statement. I would like to study that statement. But my, my prompt response to that is in line with our commitment and our conviction to consult. We are willing uh, to the to leadership and explain our side of the story. We'll, we'll have been very grateful if Consato uh, had issued that statement after it was delegated with us. And earlier on, the way I heard of resolving the problems of student funding in this country, the development of the youth and the economic development, does not lie in throwing stones at random. It lies in engagement. It lies in constructive uh, conversations. It lies on hearing the other side. It's very dangerous just to issue a statement without listening to the other side. My priest was saying to me the other day that even God himself respects the principle of listening to the other side. When Cain killed his brother Abel, God knew that Cain had killed his brother. But he still went to him and said, is it true that you killed your brother? That is respecting the view from the other side. We'll approach Constantine in that spirit. Thank you. for the questions. I'm simply going to um, supplement to some of the questions um, that have been raised. Uh, maybe just to contextualize the first question around the 4.5.4 billion, uh, whether or not uh, this is likely to recur. But maybe what we should also go back to is the history. This data is the students that were funded between the period 2017 to 2020. That's where the 5.4 billion comes in. And why is that period significant? It's because at the time, the scheme was reliant on affidavits. We were not checking um, uh, uh, these data sources that the chairperson spoke to, your SARS, your SASA, your DHA. Hence, that happened. Therefore, is this likely to be prevented in the future? Of course, from a controls perspective and to the extent that we rely on these systems, we are doing that to try and prevent that. However, we all know that there are actually underlying problems with those data sources, in that we know that there are problems at DHA, but we can't not use that system because for the most part it's a good system. We know that there are underlying problems where people, for example, when you go to SARS, you know, all these, of course, there's means where SARS verifies, but the means with SARS is that everyone is trying to show a lesser text position. So there are also those kind of limitations. We are reliant on the SASA database. We know for a fact that there are also people who are trying to access the SASA through an means. So there are those underlying limitations. However, from the scheme's perspective in terms of making sure that we put controls in place to try and prevent these instances where we have people who are not deserving um, accessing the scheme. We are putting those controls and we are continuously looking for other methods and other means we can use to rely on. Um, the, the second question um, uh, from uh, Mr. Meloy of the Sowetan, was it necessary for us, I suppose it also links to the follow-up question um, uh, by, by the writer from Puff and of this was rushed, was it necessary it is of course necessary for the scheme to make sure that it implements, continuously reviews its processes, continuously reviews its policies. And where we find gaps, uh, we then need to react and implement accordingly. And therefore it was necessary for us to implement. On the question of it being rushed, we had actually gone through a pilot phase which we did with TIVET colleges. This pilot phase was started in November last year. In fact, we, even, we continued to, do, to, to pay colleges from November last year uh, up until we implemented this in June uh, for, for universities. 
And by the way, uh, the chairperson has given us the history related to when this issue of, of direct payment came. Uh, the underlying uh, research papers that actually support the need for this to happen. And of course, even with institutions, our intention, by the way, was to implement this program at the beginning of the year. In consultation with stakeholders, and in particular uh, vice chancellors, we agreed that we give institutions three months' notice for us to do it before we could take over, and we did so. And we, we, the chairperson statement also talked to a number of consultations that uh, we have been going on. And uh, what is also interesting with this is that when we were cautioning at the time uh, when, when we implemented, say we need to slow down before we start implementing this direct payment and making sure that we've got underlying data sorted properly. Stakeholders were agitated, then when are you moving? Now we move, now all of a sudden it's too fast. But I'm saying it is necessary for us. Now on the question of um, were these fees presented during the tendering process, any tendering process, as we know, goes through multiple stages, amongst which includes pricing. Of course, we have put it on our, in our tender that prices, pricing or charges are negotiable and we wanted to negotiate. Hence, we are explaining in the statement around the fact that we had negotiated bundles on the basis of the behavior, or at least what we had assessed as the behavior, the type of transaction student would implement. And again, even post that, we continued to consult student leadership around the fact that what is it that are the typical transactions? Of course, student leadership cannot sit and form part of the tender evaluation process, nor do I sit in part of that process, by the way. However, we've gone through that negotiation, and that's why we allowed, even in how we contracted, we allowed for flex flexibility and agility in, aid in being able to really negotiate terms, going back to the table and seeing what is prevailing, what is the behavior of students, are some of these transaction types necessary or not? Hence, we kept revolving this. And by the way, even where we are, we are still going to continuously uh, review and assess whether or not this is conducive for our beneficiaries. Now, um, the chair spoke to the to the to the issue around the the, the statement um, um, that that uh, Theodore of NC asked around the COSATU statement. Uh, I'm not going to respond to the statement as we have not seen it. However, I think what I just want to touch on is in NSFAS being known for delayed uh, payments, known for defunding. Maybe I should also, uh, and it's unfortunate that we also at NSFAS have adopted this term, uh, defunded students. Actually, these are students who were ineligible to be funded to begin with because the term defunded implies that you had the right to get that benefit and therefore you were take that taken away. You are actually ineligible to begin with. And therefore, if you are found to be ineligible, is the assertion that we should continue to pay even when we know that the person does not meet the criteria. Also, the case that would happen at an, uh, with NSFAS, particularly at the beginning of the year, in the la it hasn't happened in the last uh, three years or so. Previously, the delays were around the budget confirmation, wherein there were more, there were more students that were um, found to be eligible vis-a-vis -vis the budget that was available. Of course, we understand all of these things happen within uh, the, uh, the fiscal constraint. However, I'm saying delays are attributed to that. I'm not suggesting that there are no there are, not, there are not some inefficiencies in our system, which is why we are continually trying to improve. But it's also important, as the chairperson has indicated, that some of these issues would need to be um, to be addressed uh, when, we, when we meet with the stakeholders to really understand and, where possible, uh, give root causes why these things happen. On the issue of... Um, um, criticism, I think the chairperson has covered it sufficiently. The only thing I would say is this, that firstly, I think it's quite unfortunate that in a press briefing of the National Financial Aid Scheme, uh, issues of another employer are found to be in this process. And also to say, when I was at the employer, I acted on behalf of the employer. However, the only thing I would like to say here is that during my tenure at the services sector, Either as the CFO, when I was the CFO and the CEO, the services sector continued to get 
what we call clean and unqualified audits. And therefore, any assertions about what is in the public domain, I actually choose not to respond to it, because that is also a matter that we have referred, uh, and I have also referred to my own uh, legal team. Uh, the, the, the last uh, issue is, um, I think I've covered the, the follow-up questions that, that uh, Lerato had, had asked. So um, I, th I think Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. In the absence of any further questions, I'd like to close the session. Thank you.